What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ben Smith. I hope you all are having a phenomenal Tuesday, November 23rd. We are close to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, of course, is on Thursday. Make sure you tell all of your family members that you love them. Make sure that you have a fun Thanksgiving. We're going to have a fun Thanksgiving episode with a couple of the other hosts of the Locked On MLB Network, along with myself as well. Of course, you heard earlier, my name is, of course, Ethan Smith. You can follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan. You can also follow this podcast on Twitter at Locked On Pirates. We are on YouTube, Spotify, Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you can get your podcasts. On today's episode, over the weekend, of course, the Pittsburgh Pirates picked up a pitcher in Jose Quintana. I will talk a little bit about the impact of Jose Quintana joining the team today. We're also going to talk about a star Japanese outfielder that may be on the Pirates radar. Is it a possibility that the Pirates can go and acquire him or will he be too much money or will he go to another team? I will also talk about that and the impact that could have on Pittsburgh as well as will Ben Charrington and company regret not protecting Tanaj Thomas despite a Kind of subpar 2021, even though he has a plus fastball that may attract other MLB teams. All of that and more today on the Locked On Pirates podcast. But before we get started, I want to let you guys know that I'm always thankful that you make me your first listen of the day every single day here on the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith. Let's get right into it. Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith, who does the most. I hope you all are having a phenomenal Tuesday, November 23rd, bright and early here today at 8 a.m. Eastern time. I hope you all are having a wonderful day. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody woke up. There's actually a cold front coming down in Savannah, which is why I have the Locked On podcast beanie on today with the hoodie. Again, Hope y'all are doing wonderful. Thank you, of course, for making me your first listen of the day here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. And as mentioned in the intro, we have a ton of stuff to talk about today, mainly the big news that is actual news as of right now that the Pirates have made, making their first free agent acquisition of the entire offseason by adding Jose Quintana. Jose Quintana, of course, has been in the major since 2012, playing with the Chicago White Sox, the Chicago Cubs, and of course, most recently, the Los Angeles Angels, a stint that did not work out too well for him. As you see, if you are on YouTube at the bottom of the screen, Jose Quintana has a career 3.84 3.84 uh, 3.84 ERA. Of course, over the 2020 and the 2021 season, though, he really struggled mightily to stay on the field. He had some inflammation issues. He had some wrist issues that kept him off the field in Los Angeles, despite that $8 million deal that he signed at the end of 2020. So he has not pitched too much over the past couple of years. But this deal reminds me a lot of a deal the Pirates made last season to bring in Tyler Anderson. Jose Quintana, of course, a southpaw, much like Anderson. And what are the Pirates really going to be looking for here in Jose Quintana? Well, innings eater kind of what Tyler Anderson was, and you kind of had to compare these two moves together. Jose Quintana and Tyler Anderson, of course, veteran pitchers, lefties, and you're looking to just bring back some of Quintana's 20, uh, 2012 to 2019 form, where he really looked like a very good pitcher in Chicago with the White Sox. And I think they're going to throw him right into the rotation immediately. I think he will probably be on the opening day roster, barring anything crazy. Um, I think he'll be in the opening day rotation as well, alongside guys like JT Brubaker, Mitch Keller, um, even uh, Miguel Yahure, who has a potential chance to even brawl Chad Cool, those kind of guys. Even though, as we mentioned yesterday with Gary, and he mentioned that Stephen Brawl and Chad Cool could easily be on the trade block following um, some moves where they were tendered so far and will probably get arbitration. I would fully expect once those guys are tendered that they may look to move both of them if they continue to go on the market for 
a lot of pitchers right now. Of course, Steven Matz is another guy that a lot of people are looking forward to. There's a tweet that came out last night saying that Steven Matz could potentially be making his free agent decision the day before Thanksgiving on Wednesday. So that's a very fun thing to try to keep up with to see how that goes. But I really expect Jose Quintana to play well for this Pittsburgh Pirates team. Um, his bat, um, his batted balls uh, in play per average was pretty bad in 2021. That was one of his downfalls in his play, but he does get a very good whiff rate as well. That's one of the things I really like with Jose Quintana is he can definitely force hitters to miss the ball. And a large part of his batted balls and average being so high is the Angels were not the greatest defensive team. Of course, the Pirates were tied with the Houston Astros for the best fielding percentage in all of baseball defensively in this uh, 2021 season. So hopefully that'll help him bring that down a bit. Um, again, I think if he's just one of those guys that can come in, especially on a $2 million deal where he's only a one-year $2 million deal, maybe he comes out a lot like Tyler Anderson did this year. Looks pretty good, and the Pirates can move him at the deadline for some pieces wh uh, while they wait on guys like a Max Kranich, potentially a um, Cody Bolton, guys like that who could make their debuts around the trade deadline after some moves the Pirates make if they are not a contention. We've seen crazier things in baseball. Um, also, depending on what the Pirates decide to do here the rest of the offseason, they may be in that contention form. Um, you never really know. I mean, baseball is a very interesting sport, but of course, for all intents and purposes, I don't think we expect the Pirates to be uh, competing in 2022 as things stand. But if Jose Quintana can go out there, give you five good innings every single day, not kill your relief pitching, you know, sit around a three to a four, maybe even a like four and a half ERA, just be a very solid pitcher and innings eater that could really help the rotation and teach some of the young guys in the organization how to also do the same thing. I think that'll be a win and a plus for the Pirates. I'm not going to grade this move or anything because there's just no grade to have yet. We haven't seen Quintana really pitch consistently in almost three years. So we'll see how he comes back from all of these injuries that he's dealt with. We'll see how he really develops with that. Um, I think a strong spring training will be very important for Jose Quintana as well. Um, as it was for Tyler Anderson and Tyler Anderson also got the nod on opening day. Does Jose Quintana get the nod on opening day? Probably not. I don't think, I think that'll probably go to either cool or Steven Brault if they're still here or even a JT Brubaker as well. Those guys definitely have a chance to do it. I'm also forgetting to mention guys like Will Crow uh, who were also in the rotation for the entire year, as well as Bryce Wilson. Um, so I could definitely see the pirates making a move to a six man rotation. Once again, heading into 2022, um, but I enjoy this move. I think it was just a small move for the Pirates. Um, it was a necessity, though. They do need to bring in some veteran pitching. I think they're going to look to add some relief pitching over the next couple of weeks and through the rest of the offseason. I think they're going to probably try to make some trades in that department as well. And I think Jose Quintana is just the beginning of the moves that the Pirates make here in the 2022 offseason, rightfully so. I mean, and maybe you get that 2012 through 2019 form back from Jose Quintana. Maybe you don't. We'll see. If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. I I mean, it doesn't hurt them either way. It's a one-year, $2 million deal. But I want to let you guys know that I want to know how you feel about the Jose Quintana deal. I think a lot of you let me know over the weekend how you felt about the deal and everything that went along with it. I think it was, a, again, it was a low-risk, high-reward kind of thing. Maybe the Pirates, again, maybe he really turns up, turns the notch around a little bit in 2022 gets back to his old form and they can trade him to a contender at the deadline if they aren't competing for some more prospects. And I mean, Ben Sherrington has done a phenomenal job with his prospects so far, and I've really enjoyed it um, from what I've seen. And Baseball America recently, which we'll cover this on tomorrow's episode, recently released their 2025 projected lineup as well as some of the best players by tool set and hitting and power hitting in the organization. We'll go a into a deep dive about that tomorrow. But before we continue today's podcast, I want to let you know about the wonderful people over at BetOnline. Dot ag betonline.ag of course is back and better than ever a new web interface is available at betonline.ag for the start of the basketball season and more props odds and lines are available than ever before bet online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season head to their new updated desktop or mobile device website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code locked on to receive your bonus, meaning if you throw a hundred dollars on to betonline.ag, they will give you fifty dollars of free play money to make some money and bet 
on basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, even right to your favorite Vegas casino games like Blackjack and Texas Hold'em. Don't wait to take advantage of all of the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports, and Bet Online, of course, is where the game starts. Today's episode, of course, is also brought to you by the wonderful people over at Direct TV. Direct TV, of course, is offering direct tv stream does this sound familiar you've got one device that lets you catch the game live another that lets you stream your favorite shows you're watching sports highlights on your phone and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for the good stuff well i want to tell you about a simple way to get all the entertainment that you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your tv together it's called direct tv stream and it brings your live tv and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports like baseball basketball football and hockey movies and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there is no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together today with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Now, another thing I wanted to get into today, this one a little bit more on the rumor mill side. Um, but the Pirates, of course, like many other teams, I assume, are showing interest in she Seiya Suzuki. I believe it's Seiya. I may be pronouncing it wrong, but I will call him Suzuki throughout the rest of the podcast to avoid saying his name wrong out of respect. Um, of course, Suzuki was made available to MLB teams yesterday from the Japanese Pro League, one of the best power hitting dynamic outfielders out there in Japan. He won the 2019 Japanese home run derby over in that league and bringing him in. Not going to be easy for the Pittsburgh Pirates, not going to be easy for any team. Of course, there is a little 10%, 20% kind of tax thing that you have to do with these kind of players. But what is there to know about Shea Suzuki? Well, he's a 27-year-old Japanese power hitting outfielder with serious plus power upside at the MLB level. And what do I mean by that? Well, Suzuki, of course, I mean, you look at what he was able to do over in Japan this past year. I believe he was around 38 home runs and around 100-something RBIs, which is a very good season for him. Um, he has a 315 average over in the N, uh, NPB um, over nine seasons, an OPS of 985. He's hit 182 home runs and has driven in almost 600 with 562 on his career. Um, this last season, he played for Hiroshima. He played in 131 games and slashed 319, 436, 664 with 38 home runs and more walks than he had strikeouts. Now, that is one of the things that I really like to hear about Suzuki is he's a power hitting outfielder, something the Pirates could really use in PNC Park, as well as an outfielder who does not, a power hitting outfielder that does not strike out very often. Now, of course, as asked with a lot of these um, Japanese hitters as well and players in general, is how are they going to adapt to the major leagues? Yoshi Tsutsugo being one right now. Um, he was a very good, solid power hitter over in Japan. His bat never really panned out in Major League Baseball. Now he's with Pittsburgh. It did a little bit better this season. We'll see what he looks like in 2022. But with Suzuki, I think he has serious plus power upside at the MLB level. I mean, when you're striking out less than you walk, or I mean – that's just that's always good because that means one, you're hitting the ball out of the ballpark, getting nearly 40 home runs, as I mentioned before. You're doing a lot of good things in terms of plate discipline, and you're really making sure that you do well as um in terms of all that stuff. And not even all of that. I mentioned all of his hitting. I mentioned all that, but Suzuki has also won four NPB gold gloves in his career, projects to be an above average right fielder in the defensive department, which would only help this Pirates team, which was already very solid defensively as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Sorry about that. Um, but Suzuki, again, he's a plus, like I said, a plus um, power hitter, plus defender. He would be phenomenal for any MLB team. And as mentioned again, he's going to be available to a lot of these guys. Um, and, of course, MLB Trade Rumors, one of my favorite websites in the entire world, um, is talking about his projected salary. And that's going to be the question that I ask here and probably the biggest obstacle that the Pirates have in terms of getting uh, Suzuki to play for them is what kind of deal is he slated to receive? Well, as you can see, if you're on YouTube, four to five years, around eight to $10 million per year. So about a 36 to $50 million contract. And that's not including that 10 to 20% tax. Um, but MLB trade rumors 
project Suzuki uh, will land a five-year contract around $55 million. So just a little bit over what I projected. Um, of course, land a four to five-year deal in the nine to $12 million range. Um, of course, this would eclipse uh, Ha Sung Kim. Shout out to Javier Reyes over at Locked on Padres. This would eclipse um, his contract that he got just a year ago, which was a four-year, $28 million contract from the San Diego Padres. Um, of course, again, um, the posted fee is usually $10 million to get these guys over. So go ahead and add $10 million to that $36 to $50 million contract that I mentioned. Um, and really, it just turns into a bidding war for these kind of guys. You just really have to see if it's something that you can get. And of course, this is something, again, now where you'll ask the question, do the Pirates go and get this guy? Do they Should they go get this guy? Of course, if they can get them, you go get them. I mean, as everything I've mentioned, I've only mentioned the positive things. Of course, there are some negatives to his game as well. But I mean, realistically, a power hitting right fielder who also plays very well defensively, you will take that every single day, especially if you're a team in the state that the Pittsburgh Pirates are in right now. And the thing is with Suzuki as well is, I mean, of course, I'm no baseball whisperer or anything right here. Um, over at the Locked on Pirates podcast. I'm an expert on the Pirates, but I'm not an expert on baseball entirely. I'm not like a scout that's going to be able to tell you that every single prospect that's going to be good and every single prospect that's going to be bad. So I'm not going to lie to you here. I'm not sure if Suzuki's bat will translate to the MLB level, but I'm very confident that it would. And even if it didn't right away, the guy's 27 years old. He still has plenty of time to figure it out. He had, I mean, I immediately would thrust him into the rookie of the year conversation um, in 2022 if he does indeed get picked up by an MLB team. Um, you look at the teams that are interested in him that I would think would be, I think the San Francisco Giants could probably be thrown in there, of course, trying to remain in contention despite the retiring uh, Buster Posey uh, move. The Yankees and the Dodgers, of course, I think would also be interested in his services as well. Um, even though he is primarily a right fielder, I think the Yankees could find somewhere for him to play in the outfield, maybe move Judge to center field, but Judge is also more of a better right fielder as well. Also a pretty plus defensive outfielder, if I may add. Even the Red Sox can get involved in a lot of these things. Um, the Mariners could get involved. Of course, Ichiro Suzuki, one of the best baseball players of all time, was uh, Japanese-born and was a very phenomenal player for the Seattle Mariners, so maybe they could go after him. Um, and then the Houston Astros could also be in the market. They could put him in center field instead of going after Starling Marte, even though I I think Starling Marte is probably going to go to the Houston Astros. Um, but again, the Pirates are just going to be in a bidding war with these other teams, and it appears that they are interested, so we'll see what they decide to do. Um, and of course the pirates are not going to go and spend a ridiculous amount of money this off season, but if they were going to go spend it, I would be completely okay. If they went and spent it on Suzuki here, of course, even again, a four or five year deal around the eight to $10 million range. Where does that sound familiar? Gregory Polanco power hitting right fielder defense, not as good as Suzuki. Suzuki is a much better defender than Gregory Polanco, but we saw that Gregory Polanco experiment in Pittsburgh. And I think a lot of people, even though he was a very likable player, would like to forget it just because, I mean, he was supposed to be one of the next bigger players for the Pittsburgh Pirates. It just never really panned out uh, defensively or offensively. Of course, I mean, his output home runs wise was a lot better than most people expected. But again, what can you really expect here uh, from the Pirates? I mean, maybe they go after the guy, maybe they don't. But, of course, here at the Locked on Pirates podcast, I will be covering if they do so um, with Suzuki from Japan. He will be a big question in this offseason, so we'll see what they do. And I'm going to pull it up again real quick before we get into our next segment. You guys know that you can follow me on Twitter at Locked on Pirates and at MVP underscore Ethan. You can see that right there on YouTube right now. Of course, I am Ethan Smith, the host of the Locked on Pirates podcast. I enjoy and thank you all so much for making me your first listen of the day on the Locked on Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. Make sure you check out the Locked on MLB podcast, the Locked on uh, just MLB Prospects podcast, the MLB Fantasy Baseball podcast during the season to get all of the best that you need from fantasy baseball. And with all of that said, thank you again so much for tuning into the Locked on Pirates podcast every day. One of the biggest questions that came from the 40-man roster decisions that we talked about yesterday with Gary was, will Pittsburgh regret not protecting Tanaj Thomas? Very interesting question here. Lots to boil into it. Tanaj Thomas, of course, very phenomenal player for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And, I mean, again, Tanaj Thomas, you can't really go wrong here. Eddie Yeen, another phenomenal player as well. And Tanaj Thomas, again, it's going to be a tough little thing for him. 
course, you compare him. A lot of comparisons have been made uh, to him from Luis Oviedo and how he played last year. Of course, Luis Oviedo was a big player for the Pittsburgh Pirates that they picked up in the Roll 5 draft. He didn't really pan out too well, but if you look at their stats comparable to each other, they were both around the same ERA. They both had the plus fastball, and that plus fastball is what I really think could be attractive to other teams. Of course, Tanash Thomas's biggest weakness this year was just not being able to control the baseball whatsoever. Just go watch any video of Tanash Thomas pitching this year, and you can see he'll fire the gun up. He'll get it to 96, 97, even to sometimes triple digits, but it doesn't really matter if you're throwing the ball at 100 miles per hour if you don't know where you're throwing it because eventually what's going to happen is if you can't place your fastball, they're going to catch up to it eventually. We've seen that happen with guys like Aroldis Chapman. We've seen it happen with guys like a Luis Castillo in Cincinnati who has picked up very much better than he has in recent years. But we also saw it with a guy like Dwayne Underwood Jr. Of course, he didn't really have the plus fastball, but he did struggle with command a lot this year. You saw that with a lot of Pirates pitchers. They threw the ball hard. They threw the ball decently with a lot of velocity. But if you're throwing the ball with no command and a lot of velocity, I would rather you throw it with a lot of command and less velocity because placement of pitches is probably the biggest thing that Tanaj Thomas is going to have to fix. And it's something that he will have to fix if he ever wants to be a strong pitcher in major league baseball. It's just something that he's going to have to fix on his own. And I mean, really, well, not on his own, of course, like uh, pitching coaches and stuff can help him. But we go look at Tanaj Thomas and his MILB stats. Of course, he was assigned to the uh, GCL Pirates. He was in Greensboro for most of the year. And the fact that he had a 5.19 ERA and a career 4.63 ERA through 167 innings pitched, mostly all at Greensboro or lower levels, actually all at Greensboro or lower levels, is very concerning to me. And I mean, again, he's only 22. He has plenty of time to figure it out. I think he's one of the brighter arms in this system again. And if he gets taken, he gets taken. It'll be very unfortunate. It's one of those things that you just don't wish upon the Pirates to lose this guy. But as we always say with this kind of thing, guess what? You can't keep everybody. And that's always one of the biggest things about how this uh, Rule 5 draft works. It's one of the biggest deals in terms of how teams operate and how they choose to protect players. And Again, I mean, you look at who the Pirates protected. Again, we brought it up yesterday. They have eight outfielders and nine middle infielders right now. That will not be the same as like what it is right now. That will not keep pace when the season starts. I will go ahead and let you know that right now. That will not be what you see when the season starts in a couple of months. Um, Having that many middle infielders on your 40-man roster is just unnecessary. And I don't mean guys that are going to be able to move around the diamond and go to right field, left field, center field, wherever. These guys are mainly middle infielders and they're third baseman at best. Maybe a first baseman here and there with a guy like Michael Chavis. But as Gary also mentioned yesterday and something that I wanted to bring up is I really like don't get the idea of why they think that they have so many guys that are shortstops and second baseman when they really don't. Hoy Park, defensively, not the greatest player in the world. Um, Michael Chavis, I don't think he's going to move to shortstop. I think he's either a second baseman, a right fielder, or a first baseman. You have to figure that out. And with Tanash Thomas as well, you look at the multitude of different pitchers in the system. Quinn Priester, Carmen Majinski, Max Kranich. Look at all the guys at the MLB level that are going to be competing for MLB level spots. Max Kranich, Rowenzi Contreras, um, Bryce Wilson, Miguel Yahure, Mitch Keller, Stephen Brault, Chad Cool, um, Jose Quintana now, who you throw in there. And then even relief pitching. I mean, you look at Dave Bednar. He has a spot. Hunter Stratton was another guy that I was really surprised the Pirates didn't protect either. But, I mean, again, Rule 5 draft concerns, it's not a lock that Tanaj Thomas is going to be taken, right? I'm not sitting here telling you that Tanaj Thomas is going to be gone. He's There's no definitive thing saying that the – Baltimore Orioles or the Toronto Blue Jays or one of these big teams is not going to go take him. But what is the biggest risk with taking Tanaj Thomas? This is where I think in the mind of a different team. I think in the mind of saying, okay, what is the biggest risk for another team taking Tanaj Thomas? Well, what is the biggest concern that I said I already had with Tanaj Thomas? I said his command is his biggest concern. 
So you're not going to want to put this guy in your rotation or in the bullpen worried about command and all this other stuff yet. You're going to want to place him down in like, you're going to basically want to hide him kind of like the pirates did with Oviedo. I think Oviedo is about a year or two away um, about a year or two of minors worth away from ever really being a real pitcher in the system. And they've already said that they want to make him a starter. So they're going to have to adjust him to that. The only problem is, and we also mentioned this about guys like Mason Martin, who have the very good uh, power dynamic. He could get some looks as well. Um, friend of the podcast, by the way, Mason Martin, phenomenal guy. Go check out our interview a couple months ago with him. His power dynamic is there. You know that. But it really is concerning because if you just bench these guys for the entire year and keep them on the 26-man roster or the 40-man roster, they're, they're not progressing. So then you're losing a year of progression. You're going to probably throw them in the system again, and then you're probably going to have to have them down there for about a year or two for him to finally get his command together. And that for the Pirates, that's no problem. They have pitchers at the t- at the levels that they need to have them right now to where Tanaj Thomas can eventually be the pitcher they want to be. They can keep him in the minors for that one or two years if he is not picked up. For another team, though, They have to put him on the 40-man roster, keep him on the 40-man roster, or he comes back to Pittsburgh, much like we saw with a lot of players like Jose Soriano, who got sent back to the Angels the Pirates picked up uh, this past year. But what's the? there's a lot of risk in taking Tanaj Thomas. There always is with these Rule 5 picks. And, I mean, realistically, will the Pirates regret it if he's taken? Maybe. Maybe. It's kind of a toss-up. It's really one of those things that we'll see if the Pirates do lose him. I personally don't think they will. I think he has the plus fastball. He has the grades to be a phenomenal pitcher that could be very attractive to other teams. But I think he'll ultimately end up staying in Pittsburgh. I think they'll put him in Altoona or Greensboro in 2022, and I think he will continue to develop. I think he will hopefully fix his command, and I think he will be a phenomenal pitcher for this Pirates team in years to come. With all of that said, guys, thank you so much for always tuning in to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith. You can follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan. You can follow this podcast on Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and, of course, anywhere where you can get your podcasts. Make sure you download, like, subscribe, and comment if you're on YouTube. You guys have been killing the subscriber button. Make sure you keep following on Twitter as well. With all that said, make sure you also go to the Locked On Bets podcast with your boy Q and Lee Sterling if you want to go make some money in a big college football weekend this weekend or even on Thursday night football or hockey or basketball action. Lee Sterling and your boy Q have all of your betting needs over at Locked On Bets. Guys, thank you so much. Fun podcast today. I, of course, will be back tomorrow to cover all of the Baseball America projections that the Pirates are involved in as they finally got to the Pirates in their projections. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Stay warm. Stay fun. Thanksgiving is a couple days away. That turkey is this close for you guys. And guess what? I will be here no matter what. You're getting a Thanksgiving Day episode. Guys, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you on the flip side.